Hi, uh, welcome back. Um, we, uh, before starting uh, this session, I, I have some um, some bad bad news. We have just learned that two Spanish journalists, David Beriain and Roberto Fraili, were killed while working on a documentary about poaching in Burkina Faso, Western Africa. We are very sad and want to send our condolences to their families and all journalists in Spain. Before we start our next session at ISOJ, we would like to ask for a minute of silence to honor the memories of David and Roberto. Okay, thank you, thank you very, very, very much, um, and um, our condolences again to our, our all our our colleagues in Spain for for this loss. The second day of ISOJ has been very strong. We um, hope you had a chance to to attend all sessions, but if you have missed any session, remember that we have the recordings of, of all sessions on YouTube. You can just go to the playlist at ISOJ's Night Center um, YouTube channel. So let's move along to our next session, the first of two research panels at ISOJ 2021, featuring articles that won the blind review competition for ISOJ Research Journal. Today's panel is Capturing Journalism's Evolution from Algorithms to Missing for Information and will be chaired and presented by my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Amy Schmidt-Weiss, San Diego State University, who is uh, ISOJ uh, Research Chair and is the co-editor of the hashtag IS ISOJ Journal with, with me. Uh, but she does the real work, uh, she works hard. She has always worked hard since, since she was a graduate student here at UT. So I know her, you should know that. So uh, don't, don't forget to be thinking about questions you have for our presenters so we can ask the, those questions uh, at, at the end, okay? So let's go to the first research panel. Hi, and welcome to our first research panel of ISOJ. We hope you're having a fantastic time and enjoying all the panels. Uh, today, our research panel is featuring the papers from our blind reviewed paper competition that we had, that also these articles appear in our ISOJ journal, which is available in print hard copy, as well as digital. And you can check out the journal at isoj.org slash research uh, at any time during the conference. I highly recommend you read the journal and check out the amazing work of our scholars. Today we have three really great studies that are going to look at the evolution of journalism today, going from algorithms to misinformation and more. And I think we're gonna have a really great time. So we're gonna go ahead and kick it off uh, to start with Sylvia Dadin and Amanda Journal from the Federal University of Inais de Reis. And they're gonna talk with us about an amazing uh, initiative of Brazilian robot initiatives in Brazil. Hi, Amy. Thank you for presenting us. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here with you. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure for us to present our research at the International Symposium of Online Journalism. My name is Silvia Dalbain. I am a journalist and I earned a master's degree in communication at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. 
And if this pandemic allows, I'm planning to start a PhD in journalism next fall semester at the University of Texas at Austin. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Giorno, and I'm a doctor in communication by the Federal University of Minas Gerais. We are both researchers and journalists interested in understanding the relationship between technology and journalism. This research is a combination of findings and thoughts developed by me and Silvia during her master and my PhD, together with our advisor, Professor Carlos D'Andrea, at the group RAS, Social Technical Network Studies in Brazil. Well, this research describes and analyzes five robots created in Brazil seeking the professionals involved in automated journalism in an attempt to demonstrate the complexity of networks associated with these initiatives. Our methodology included semi-structured interviews and information collected in news and online digital platforms, intending to identify the actors assembled in these five case studies. The five cases in the study are not created by great, great enterprises, but instead are developed by crowdsourcing teams or digital native newsrooms comprised with data journalism. These Brazilian robot reporters follow a different logic of those adopted by newspapers from North America, Europe, and Asia, because they do not write any automated story, but focus on processing open data and creating alerts published in social media platforms. They use AI to process large volumes of data and Twitter platform as the main channel to dist distribute information and interact with readers. These particular uses of natural language generation in Brazilian journalism demonstrate how technology systems are hip objects shaped by social, cultural, and political issues and have multiple uses depending on the context they are inserted. So, inspired by the anti-essentialist lenses of science and technology studies, we understand technological artifacts as occasional and temporary products directly related to a given network of actors and their circumstances of their production which are shaped by and also shape the world in which they belong. The first robot is Damata. The robot Damata reporter was created to monitor legal Amazon deforestation using data retrieved from Terra Brasilis, an env environmental monitoring platform created by the National Institute of Special Research, maintained by the Brazilian federal government. Launched in July 2020, it publishes an alert on Twitter every time new data about deforestation in the Amazon is published. The initiative also maintains a second Twitter account in English, as you can see in the slide. The bot was developed by researchers for, from the University of Sao Paulo and the Federal University of Minas Gerais in a team composed of computer engineers, information scientists, and linguists. Our second bot is Rosi da Serenata, who was created to fight against corruption. Named Rosi in an allusion to the Jacksons, Robert published alerts every time it finds suspicious expenses of a Brazilian federal deputy that was refunded with public money. Each tweet quotes the deputy's name with a link to a regional document and asks Twitter's users for help to verify if it's irregular or not. Since August 2018, the project is part of Open Knowledge Brazil, a partnership to internationalize and inspire similar initiatives abroad. Our third, our th uh, oh my God, <laughs> our third robot is called Bot. It monitors the Brazilian government's transparency websites, checking if they are working, and posts alerts on Twitter and Mastodon when a page is down asking users for help to check if information proceeds. The robots, part of the Brazilian collaborative initiatives Colabora Dados, specializing in transparency and open data that describes itself as committed to veracity and easy access to information. Named in a tribute to a famous Brazilian jurist, Rui Barbosa, our fourth robot monitors lawsuits at the Brazilian Supreme Court and publish an alert on Twitter 
Every time it attacks, nothing new happened in a lawsuit for more than six months. Committed with the transparency of the judiciary in Brazil, Rui Barbot is the result of the work of a multidisciplinary team, including a lawyer, a product manager, and many journalists. And here is the fifth. Created some months before Brazil's presidential election in 2018, Fatima's name is an abbreviation of Fact Machine. It monitors Twitter's feed every 15 minutes and publishes a reply every time it detects a tweet spreading a biased news link, sending to the user an alert and those fatos link with the checked information. The project follows the methodology created by the International Fact Checking Network, and Aos Fatos team also conducts studies to understand the Brazilian news consumption and readers' main doubts. In addition to Twitter, Fatima has two other versions acting as chatbot on, on Facebook Messenger since October 2018 and in WhatsApp since April 2020. We argue that the idea of automated journalism as narratives produced by software without human intervention after the initial programming stage overestimate the programmer's work and overshadows the role done by other professionals, turning invisible a complex social technical network mobilized in those initiatives. With these interviews and descriptions of five Brazilian case studies, we wanted to show in this research how those initial concepts of are limited and insufficient to define automated journalism and express its plurality. We argue that innovative initiatives like this involve an intricate, intricate, oh my God, my accent, an intricate ecosystem under formation, a new ecosystem that is being built, composed by multiple professionals working together in multidisciplinary teams to automate simple and repetitive tasks saving journalists time to be dedicated in roles that cannot be automated. When we look at those technologies as social and political apparatus working in a more complex network of professionals and artifacts, we abandon the idea that NLG software could replace reporters. It is important to highlight that those initiatives of automated journalism in Brazil are carried out independently and four of them are committed to transparency and open data, publishing their codes on GitHub, for example. Contrary to the most recognized examples of automated journalism worldwide, none of them are associated with traditional media companies and hegemonic journalism. Rosie and Cola Borawat are maintained by volunteers who keep them up and running with donations and crowdfunding resources. The matter reported is developed by researchers with funds from two Brazilian universities. And finally, Fatima and Rui Barbot are managed by two digital native journalism initiatives, Aos Fatos and Jota, respectively, and have a hybrid business model that combine editorial partnerships and funding support for technology projects. The Brazilian case studies described here demonstrate a plurality of applications of NR and LG software in journalism, which are shaped by the social, political, and cultural contexts where they belong. By helping journalists automate their repetitive everyday tasks, these five robots also manage and tailor networks, and they are not mere tools journalists use daily. As technical objects, they discover important facts, process information, and act by posting it on Twitter, drawing attention to certain topics that could go unnoticed by journalists and other actors in the social debate. Some argue that journalists should learn programming language in order to be able to perform these tasks automations on their own. We do think that professionals should understand programming logic and its knowledge should be disseminated and democratized in these rooms. But the wealth of multidisciplinary teams is enriching for the work and shouldn't be eliminated. We believe that the exercise of working with engineers, designers, information scientists, linguists, and other professionals in the development teams contributes to the expansion of journalist perspectives and functionalities of these social technical artifact, artifacts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sylvia and Amanda for that insightful presentation of your research. Uh, we're going to go on next to our next presenter, uh, which is Amber Hinesley from Texas State University, also a University of Texas alum. Yay. <laughs> uh, and she's going to be talking about audience demographics and how this plays a role in today's misinformation uh, that is rampant in our world. And so we will kick it off to you. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, so uh, let me share my screen here. Sorry, just a moment. I can't talk and do anything else at the same time. Um, set up here. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction, Amy. So I will say that like a lot of the other journalists or a lot of the other journals and professors uh, and academics who are presenting here, I am also a former journalist. And so I've drawn a lot of my research throughout my career based on my experiences as a reporter and editor in the newsroom. And so for the past few years, what's that, what that has meant is that I'm looking a lot at misinformation and social media. The study I'm talking about today looks at how the audience's education, political leaning, et cetera, play a role in which news cues they rely on. Things like headlines and photos when they're trying to identify misinformation. Also looking at their demographics in terms of how those may influence their tendency to seek out information that confirms what they already believe and how all of this may affect their confidence in their own ability to identify fake news. You know, um, you know, in terms of why this matters, I'm going to start here with a breakdown of why these particular things are important as part of the larger conversation that we collectively in academia, as well as newsrooms and think tanks are having about so called fake news. You know, what's the role of these things as people are trying to identify misinformation? I love this quote to start with from the study that Pew did in August because I think it, it understates national sentiment about Americans' relationship with news media. In that same Pew study, they found a deep partisan divide in perceptions of news coverage and expectations for articles to be inaccurate and for journalists to intentionally mislead audiences. Other studies have found that political ideology plays a role in individuals' perceptions of fake news and misinformation. We can fairly clearly conclude that political leaning influences how large swaths of the public view news media. But what's not as clear is how or if demographics also drive that relationship. Um, and so we can look at how social identity theory helps explain the connection that individuals feel toward their social groups which includes their sense of, the, you know, the, the sense of belonging they have via race, gender, political ideology, and why those connections can influence their assessments of misinformation. In seeking to understand uh, and define ourselves, we, can, we foster a sense of shared connectedness with others who we see as being like us. One of the ways we come to know ourselves is through how we define ourselves in terms of our demographics. If you take a moment to think about how central some of these things may factor into your sense of self and how important they are and how you see others. Journalists use these news cues to establish credibility and the audience has learned to look for these cues to varying degrees when they're trying to determine accuracy. News cues help consumers manage information overload because it makes it easier for them to look to these cues to decide whether they want to further pursue the information that they're presented with. You know, as users judge the credibility based on these news cues, they're processing these features in the context of how they, how they relate to them and their interests. Um, since news cues influence perceptions of a news story, um, they are particularly relevant as journalists struggle to help their audiences differentiate between legitimate reporting and fake news. With confirmation bias, another component in understanding what influences um, our determinations of what is or is not misinformation, people prefer information that validates what they already believe. Um, we all tend to do this. Previous studies have found that, that people seek out material from sources they perceive as being in group and assign greater credibility to it. If you think about your own personal preferences for news, you probably tend to gravitate towards some sources other, over than others, and you lend more credibility to those sources that you agree with, that you see as presenting you know, your truth. In analyzing the influence of people's social identities as they relate to race, gender, 
political ideology among those other demographic variables, it can shed light on how confirmation bias functions in regard to fake news assessments. Other uh, research has also shown that news consumers with strong political beliefs, so that's folks on either side of the political spectrum here in the US, um, they tend to spend more time with news sources that support and reinforce their views. So all of this then can result in an online echo chamber that, uh, you know, it's made up of people in your group or groups um, who are decrying oppos oppositional information as fake news. And then lastly, turning to the final research question in this study, looking at confidence. Confidence is a crucial element in suppressing the spread of misinformation. It's also a very complex process to develop confidence in doing anything, including how confident you are in your own ability to identify fake news. For the analysis of misinformation, it really depends upon the strength of the argument that someone's considering and how relevant it is to their life. New information can threaten any number of identities that an individual holds, especially if it's seen as a direct challenge to a particularly salient identity. Um, individuals whose, whose demographic details are really tightly bound in their sense of identity, uh, you know, whether it's on their political ideology, gender identity, um, you know, those help them assess information in the context of what they think their group believes, and then they develop confidence that those evaluations are correct and accurate. In terms of the method for this study, it was an online study with participants who were provided through the survey firm Qualtrics. They were all adults with at least one social media account. The demographic data in the table here, these were the independent variables in this study. Um, had to collapse the race categories in order to run the analysis because the data was so spread out. Um, but the data was collected for white, African-American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian American, Native American, multiple races, and other. With education, the options ranged from less than high school, high school, some college, all the way through to a doctoral degree. And then for political ideology, it was a, a spectrum that started with very liberal, somewhat liberal, closer to liberal, neither liberal or conservative, and then repeated those same options for conservative. Again, a little bit more on the method now, turning to the dependent variables, um, the things I just talked about with the research questions. The question wording is here on the screen and it's for each dependent variable and also lists how it was measured. The wording for each of these was validated through previous studies. All right, so you may look at this and think, I'm not a stats person and I don't know where to look. Uh, what you wanna do is look for the squares with numbers in them because that shows where there was a significant relationship. Because of the number of the independent and dependent variables involved in analyzing this research question, I did individual regression tests for each news queue to determine the influence of the demographic variables on each one. So this is actually a lot of regressions that were run here. Um, political ideology is one of the big ones here. And what it shows is that it was a significant factor in six of the features. So if you look down that column there, um, you know, so people who were more liberal, were more frequently saying that they relied on examining the URL, story appearance, headline, visuals, date published, links, when they were trying to determine whether news stories get, um, contain misinformation. Education level was also a significant influence if you look down that column there, with more highly educated individuals reporting they spend more time conducting research on their own, assessing objectivity, as well as looking at the URL, author, and sources. Taken together, <laughs> if you look at all of the cues, um, only the URL of the story was significant across the five uh, demographic variables. And the appearance of information as looking like a news story was significant uh, in three of those. The remaining news cues were significant in only one or two variables. And what this suggests is there's a lot of work to be done to improve recognition of these features as keys to identifying misinformation. Uh, going on to the next one here, a lot smaller table, not as much to look at here. This looks at confirmation bias. And what this tells us is that it has several drivers with the following demographic variables indicating that having information confirm what they already believe was of great importance to them, being male, non-white, less educated, and more conservative. That confirmation bias was significant in four of the five areas indicates that certain individuals' identities may influence their desire for information that does not challenge what they perceive their in-group as believing to be true. 
And then finally, with the last research question, political age, ideology, education were significant influences again. Um, with people this time who were younger, more liberal and more educated, being more confident in their ability to recognize information. This is in stark contrast to demographic identities of those who reported for research question two, that they rely on information that confirms what they already believe. All right, so what are the big takeaways, right? What can we do with this? Demographics are foundation for identities um, that we hold as well as the groups we feel a sense of connectedness to. These can, um, you know, if we look at the highlights in terms of the importance of understanding how our social identities can inform what we see as credible cues of legitimate news, why certain individuals may seek out information that confirms what they believe, and why other, you know, why other groups report feeling more confident in their ability to identify fake news. All of this can be used in developing more effective news literacy strategies. In particular, if we look at the sustained influence of education across these RQs, it suggests it could be one of the most important factors in bridging partisan ideologies. Um, you know, if we if we focus more specifically on like how this can help um, and what it may tell us is that repeated news literacy training could help build research skills and an appreciation for objectivity, which has a trickle down influence on several of the other news cues that were not as important um, on the previous list. That younger people showed greater frequency in looking at certain news cues suggests the effectiveness of concerted efforts um, you know, with media, media literacy skills training in K-12 and other places. To kind of wrap things up then, um, you know, we think about, you know, concern that we have with people who identify as more conservative. And one way that we can combat this problem question I have up here on the screen is to focus on people who are seen as in group, right? So it may not be that you are the best person to talk to them, finding someone else to talk to them um, may be actually a better person to talk to. And then finally, you know, the last point here is that, um, you know, those with, actually, let me, I kind of already covered that, sorry. To wrap it up then, um, if you're thinking, how can this data help journalists and other groups fight misinformation? These ways are outlined in the study here. You know, what we want to focus on doing is, with the demographic data, it provides a clearer detail about which areas need greater focus in the effort to help people become more critical consumers of news and information and learn which cues can signal credibility. So I thank you for that, and thank you for your interest and for all of us in the, our research that we presented here today. Thank you so much, Amber, for that insightful study that helps us to have some new ideas about news literacy efforts, I think, that can help in terms of scholarship and, and also for newsrooms alike. Thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna jump to our last uh, research present presenters, uh, Burton Speakman from Kennesaw State University and Marcus Funk, also a UT alum uh, from Sam Houston State University. They're going to talk with us about zombie content and paywall policies in American community newspapers. So take it away, Marcus and Burton. Hi, Amy. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Burton Speakman, an assistant professor at Kennesaw State. Hi, I'm Marcus Funk. I'm at Sam Houston State. I'm thrilled to be here. All the burnt orange and the color scheme makes me really happy. All right. So our paper, What's on Your Page on Your Page, talks about zombie content and periwall policies. And what we did was in 2015, 400 community news websites were, were looked at to see sort of what their basic policy was in terms of online content. And then in 2012, we looked at those same websites. Every site that we looked at was live and functional in 2015. It might have been barely functional, but it was functional. And we looked at things like hard paywalls, metered paywalls. Um, and then in 2020, we looked for things like redirected sites and zombie sites. And one of the things that was interesting about this is in 2015, 400 community out of these, 211 of them allowed full access to all of their digital content. Uh, 129 used some form of metered paywall that allowed a limited number. The limits varied fairly widely. Three, five, and 10 were the most common. And then 60 did not allow the public to do any content access. Now, what we started to see five years later was things had started to change quite a bit. Only 97 publications allowed viewers to freely read all their content. And 
one of the interesting aspects of this and something that's going to change is a lot of those publications that didn't have a paywall were part of the recent Gannett Gatehouse purchase and Gannett had not put their standard paywall onto the Gatehouse publication. So this number is going to have changed whenever Gannett decides to put that up there. But at this point, um, we had a lot of places that were using sort of that standard, uh, I'm sorry, there were 169 co publications at this point that utilized some form of paywall, 37%. Uh, and then we were looking at conversely at this point or in 2020, we had 60% of these community newspaper websites that were using some form of paywall. So it went up not quite double, but pretty close to it. And one of the things you need to, to notice is what some of these things, some of these changes were. So when you're looking at essentially what they were doing was automatically redirecting at times. So these publications that didn't exist in the same way they did before, some of them were automatically redirecting like, well, not this one, but others that we're looking at. And in a number of these, instances the smaller publication existed as somewhat of a sub page but but not really but what you were looking at again was a lot more of these hard paywalls like we're looking at right in front of us now where to look at any article you had to log in and you immediately hit this login page so here's our percentages here's what those look like Again, you're looking at a, a big change in terms of a lot more metered paywalls, a lot fewer places that had no paywalls, a lot fewer places that were doing anything. And then the really frightening part was 30% of the publications were inactive or deceased in some way, shape, or form from the community news publications websites from 2015. That's a really big drop. I guess that's stating the obvious. Uh, one of the more common examples, again, was the idea of them being rolled into the larger publications. The Charlotte Observer, there were multiple publications that existed and had their own websites in 2015 that were now part of the Charlotte Observer's main page, and that was where you were redirected in 2020. Others had been taken over by various sources. Uh, this was a community news publication that was actually taken over by a city government. They found that there were enough visitors, there were enough people who wanted to come that they felt the site had value and took it over. Other sites had just stopped updating. This is one that had stopped updating in 2017. This was the first article on the website. Here is the Nebraska Journal Leader, and this is their entire website. A little video, a way to subscribe. It is a website, but it doesn't really provide any information. And there were quite a few of these in 2015 as well. And you'll also, if you really look through this list, you would see some that had basically just a PDF of their, their front page that you could look at, and that was, less common in 2020 than in 2015, but it, it did still exist. In other cases, uh, these former news sites had completely changed and completely been abandoned. For example, this one was taken over by an Indonesian gambling site, and this was a full chain worth of sites. I think there were five or six of these in our particular study where it was one small community news chain that had 20 publications and several of them were, were part of our study and they were all going to the same site. And another one, it was a commercial website that had taken it over and this was another example out of some of those 30%. And the commercial site realized the value of the community news site, but they, and had even set up a website that looks sort of like a news site, but it really isn't. Other times you'd run into something like this. This was a specific page within Gannett for, I believe, no, I'm sorry, this was a MLive, Michigan Live site, where they had 
a number of small community sites and then all of them had been rolled into the main site. And when you tried to go to the link, the original link, you were getting an error message. So all of this really reflects the word zombie. That's not just an opportunity for us to, to make horror puns. It's very deliberate word choice because at least since George Romero reinvented the genre in 1968, zombies have never been just zombies. They're shuffling, lurching metaphors for a whole spectrum of social ills. And the horror comes from mindlessly existing and perpetuating inequality or injustice, not the fact that they are literally alive after they should be dead. And in a similar way, zombie news sites aren't just about websites that don't update anymore, that are still sort of there, but not serving any practical purpose, or they're redirecting to something completely foreign and completely different. These aren't just relics or shiboliths that are somehow still hanging on, clinging to undead life. Those that have been appropriated by non-journalists aren't just big surprises for folks looking for no local news and instead finding something in a foreign language or something completely different. Instead, we're using the term zombie because it reflects the economic trends squeezing community news that so many of these websites still technically exist, but in miniature or collapsed under a regional site or appropriated in some way that undermines local community and local identity reflects uncertainty and poor planning regarding paywalls and digital business models that the writing's been on the wall for quite some time for a lot of these trends. And yet still, like the folks that get zombified halfway through the movie instead of at the beginning, it still happens. We're still finding ways to fall into these same traps and suffer these same economic issues. And two, these zombified sites point to a deeper and I think much more serious question. All politics used to be local, as the saying goes. And there was a real value in local identity and local community and local content. But all these local news sites closures and zombifications, are they suggesting that perhaps that's not the case anymore? Well, and I, I think that one of the things, because you know this conference is so professionally focused, I wanted to sort of bring up at the very end of this, is the idea that publications that had had paywalls in 2015 were much less likely to be among those 30% that went out of business. So that shows that companies that are at least trying something seem to have had better luck for not closing down. But for those larger chains that had rolled themselves into larger media outlets, that's a essentially a running up the white flag for the local market because the expectation cannot be that these young people are going to suddenly come to your print publication after f developing other news habits and you know to a large degree it, it appears that a lot of publications have essentially given up on local small local community markets with other than in print with the expectation that those publications are going to fold I can't come up with another solution. Well, thank you, Burton. And thank you, Marcus, for that insightful presentation on zombie news. It kind of gives us a little bit of sadness at the same time to see the state of what's happening in uh, community and local news. Um, but thank you again for sharing that with us. And this has just been an amazing panel so far of the three uh, articles that are featured in the ISOJ journal and on the website. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to discussion and Q&A so we can get started with asking our scholars um, more questions about their research. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in with our questions. Uh, we've got quite a few here, so we'll see how we do in terms of timing. Uh, I think the first question we want to pose to the panel um, is going to go over to Amber. Um, you know, Amber, uh, Margaret Schneider wants to know, what does objectivity in the context of key news cues mean? If you could elaborate a little bit more for us to tell us how you were looking at that in your research. 
Sure, absolutely. And one of the things that we did with this was we didn't prime people by telling them this is what objectivity means. We just said objectivity and they answered based on whatever their own conceptualization is of that. And so one of the things that we see from other research beyond the study is that the public does not have a great idea of what objectivity means. Um, if you look at some other research, and so this is something that would be interesting to dive into more with other you know, future studies about misinformation is when people say, you know, they look for objectivity in stories when they're trying to determine if it's misinformation or if it contains misinformation, what does objectivity look like to the audience? Because as journalists, we know what that means, but by and large, the audience does not have a great concept or an accurate conceptualization of what that is. I think that's a really good point that kind of gets back to the other big finding that you had in your research of looking at how much education played a role in this. And so I was curious to kind of get a, a sense from you, where do you think we go from here in terms of, of looking at that aspect of education um, from the from several points? So <laughs> right. one from the point of, of uh, the newsroom, right, of thinking about this, you talk a little bit about this from the news literacy side. But second, I would say, you know, from from the greater sense of the actual, you know, journalism educators who may be watching this um, and in the classroom training the future journalists, you know, what can be harnessed in these moments and, and kind of diving into that of looking at that aspect? Right. Well, and you know what this says is there's a lot to be done because there's <laughs> a lot that people are not looking at that as journalists, we think, oh, my gosh, why aren't you looking at this? Like, I really wish you would be looking at this. Um, you know, can help you so much kind of thing. But what it does show is that, you know, especially with education is that that can be a key. And so it reinforces the necessity of news literacy education and of just information literacy education that we see here in the US, you know, different, different districts and different states have different standards for what that looks like. Um, but for me, what it says is that those things look like they're working and we need to do more of them. And kind of keep in mind that this is not, you know, we're talking so much about vaccines here, you know, worldwide, that with news literacy, it's not a one shot inoculation. That news literacy needs, you know, we need boosters throughout our lives for this, um, especially as information changes. You know, we had a session earlier today that was fantastic talking about how social media has changed the landscape for misinformation. And especially with COVID-19, how misinformation spreads so much and so quickly on social media versus how journalists were trying to confront it and debunk or pre-bonk some of that information. Um, you know, so for me with this, it's we already knew that political ideology played a role in how people perceive fake news. Um, but the education part of it is how that's maybe our best way forward in counteracting people's perceptions of misinformation. And perhaps it comes down to really delving deeper into thinking about what that form of education, what form of training can be approached and looking at it from a variety of different perspectives as well, right? Um, right. I, I'm going to transition here from Amber to, to Burton and Marcus because I think education is um, potentially a connector with your research as well, right? When we look at, you said 30% of the, these sites were inactive or deceased in the past five years. Um, you know, and how this puts a real big, um, you know, crisis, it has been, right, for, for community journalism. And so I'm curious to kind of know from your perspective, how do you think, you know, tying into the realm of education and having people understand and know <laughs> the, the role of community journalism, the role of local news, you know, do you see that as a, as a potential pathway here or, um, are we doomed to more zombie, zombie news content? Zombie, I mean a new word. <laughs> zombie I love zombie. <laughs> zombie works. <laughs> well, well, I'll take. Go ahead, Bert. No, you you go ahead. Okay, from an education standpoint, I think there are a ton of really vivid opportunities for local reporting and local news because this is where our graduates in journalism schools and in mass communication programs go. They don't go straight from the classroom to the New York Times. They go to those small weekly publications or those alternative publications right in our own backyards. And I think the more we incentivize our students to participate in that media, the richer that media will be. And that'll trickle down too to the rest of the community because the better reporting is in those local media, then the more likely people are to read it. And I think 
it plays a role in polarization too, because it's really easy to have a really passionate opinion about what's going on in DC when that's, you know, eight states away and hundreds and hundreds of miles. But it's a lot more difficult to be radically polarized or be chanting fake news cues when you're talking about something happening in your own community. And I, I it's sad that in some ways, the ecosystem that seems the simplest to solve these problems at the local level is also the same media ecosystem that is suffering so badly. Well, and I think part of that, I mean, if you look at the pointer studies over the last 20 years, people are much more trusting in their local media than they are the media in general. And when we lose those local media sites, that's where people develop trust in the media. That's where younger people kind of learn from their parents about what's going on. So it worries me as these sites go away and these local news sources continue to fold and we lose them, that we're losing that first line of defense in terms of teaching students media literacy, in terms of teaching young people media literacy. So I guess Marcus took the optimistic approach, so I guess I went the other way. <laughs> What what fact uh, what risks do you think this poses to to what represents local identity and in the community uh, in this regard? I think it has a lot to say about what local identity is because there are certain elements that people tend to rally around within their community and the local newspaper, particularly when I worked in, from what I learned about the weeklies in Texas and those types of places was that people were very tied up. They felt an ownership. It was theirs. It was their publication. And when they lose something that's theirs, that's a piece of their identity that's gone. And think about too, what fills that void because it doesn't stay a vacuum. We see social media pages start to assume those responsibilities. We see highly partisan social media platforms or, or individuals on social media filling that void and filling it in many cases with garbage in a way that a local newspaper had a filtering ability, had a refereeing responsibility that's just absent on a lot of the digital social media pages that crop up in their absence. Well, and I think it, it also transitions over into the realm of, of aggregation, automation as well, right? looking at it from, from that perspective and how that can can have such a huge detriment in terms of really understanding the local community. And uh, I think, it, you know, we, everybody's connecting here uh, with their research today. So on the side of automation, coming over to uh, Amanda and Sylvia, you know, looking at the, the research that you embarked in, I think it's really interesting to show how you're, you're looking at it from a different perspective that oftentimes in scholarship, focuses on on automated journalism from the standpoint of something that is is quite uh, technical as an object that doesn't really have any human inter intervention in it. And I think your research shows that there are these important individuals uh, from the media and from other entities that are working on creating a different kind, as you said in your article, different kind of journalistic content. And I was kind of uh, curious to know from, from both of you, how do you see this shaping um, in terms of specific journalism in Brazil um, within this context? Uh, well, I can be the first, Amanda. Yeah, sure. Can I start? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I started this research looking for, not this research as specific from Brazil, but before I started researching automated journalism, looking for case studies in the United States. And every time I was, uh, I was curious about who were the people who were developing, who were working on the backstage. Uh, and uh, some of the scholarship that I, I read uh, in the beginning, like 2012, 2014, uh, they used to say that uh, those initiatives of automation uh, would uh, take off the human intervention, except for the programmers. And this kind of bothered me a little bit. So I try, uh, in 2018, I got to know uh, Operação Serenata do Amor, uh, Serenata do Amor Operation, was the first initiative that I, got, I, I saw here in Brazil. 
and I had the opportunity to talk closer to the people, to the journalists, and understand a little bit more how this technology wa was being developed and uh, how the journalists would uh, be part of this uh, news and this content that was automated producer. So what I think that is re really different here in Brazil comparing to this experience, the initiatives that I uh, observed in the United States is because here we don't have a bigger outlet, news outlet, or bigger newsroom investing on it. So I took more, uh, we took more uh, native news, uh, digital native news content from uh, smaller websites, younger websites, or also crowdsourcing initiatives from young journalists that uh, get together with programmers and with uh, data analysts and start to work with open data. Because our uh, information uh, access law, we call it lie here in Brazil, is really it's from 2011. It's re it's, it doesn't have, it will be 10 years old now. So what the journalists started to get uh, contact with open data and this fight against corruption uh, got them to, to set up, to shape these initiatives here in Brazil. We've been uh, working together for years now and what moves us is thinking about the materialities of platforms and how they play a role in communication and uh, mediating our sharing of information and the things we uh, we get to read we get to know um this is the point we, where our researchers connect and i and i think that we, what we wa we wanted to show in this research is uh Two things, on one side, the platforms and, and their algorithms play a role that is a, a bad role in, in this circulating of information that is, um, uh, I forgot the, 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 the term in English, but um, helping spread the, the, biased informa the biased information, disinformation, misinformation, and making people um, be more and more in their own bubbles. But there are, there are other sides of these algorithms and platforms, materialities that can help uh, journalists. And, and we have to understand them and to look at them um, as partners and uh, not mere tools journalists use in their daily routine. They, they're partners. They, they, can, they can be useful to free journalists to do other stuff, to do other things that only humans can do. Uh, until now, <laughs> at least. So I think um, this is the, this is what what connected us in this research. It, what we wanted to show. And what one, one interesting thing that we have to get in mind is when we talk about robots, we also have that imaginary came from <laughs> fiction films that humanoid robots. Uh, and actually, when we look to those technologies, what we are dealing with are computers, algorithms, softwares, uh, some objects that are part of uh, newsrooms, daily routines for decades. Since 1990s, we are connected in the internet. We don't use any more that, uh, I don't know the name in English, but the machines to type. We are using computers and we are using softwares. We are connected to the internet. So. Uh, it's not something that is, we are not looking for something from the future, but actually we are dealing with things that are more close to our present, the, our future, when we think of these automated information, automated content. We have a question from Jose Elias Sanchez Ramos, who wants to know, do you think artificial intelligence will replace the journalist? <laughs> yeah, that's the point. That, uh, that when we started this research, uh, when I started this auto, research in automated journalists back in 2013, uh, this was my fear. Like I was, oh my gosh, if there, there's coming robots to my profession, should I keep being a journalist or not? What is this? And that was my main uh, motivation to research automated journalism. 
But what I got in those past years studying these, and I think Amanda also in our path, because we, we know each other for many years now, uh, is that uh, we are not talking about uh, uh, automated robots that are working uh, besides journalists and besides the newsrooms. Actually, our technologies that are inserted, new technologies that are inserted in our profession and working side by side with journalists, but also with programmers, with data analysts, with maths, with physicians, with physics, uh, uh, people, people that works with uh, other sides of the information, helping to build news stories, uh, other kinds of stories that we can produce nowadays with the internet. So when we think about the repla being replaced by robots, I could say that no, we are not being replaced by robots, but we have to be open to other professionals that will be side by side with us uh, on the newsrooms, not just journalists, but other kinds of backgrounds and also open to other technologies. And when we think in technology, our profession, if we think historically, journalism was always shaped by technologies. Uh, we were shaped with uh, the, the press, a Gutenberg press. I don't know if this is the, the right word to say in English. We, we, we were shaped because of the invention of television. We, uh, our profession was shaped with the invention of radio and now with the internet. And I think this is just one more tool, one more technology that will help to shape the future or the present future of journalism. Amanda, I see that you have a question for Amber connecting to, uh, to your work with hers. <laughs> yes, I do. I would like to hear, Amber, uh, what you think about the role um, this um, platform materialities play in this misinformation circulation and um, uh, in the spread of misinformation because I know this this was not part of your research question but I would love to hear you on that sure well and so you know I can speak to kind of what what I'm aware of here and what's happening in the US and you know a little bit internationally um, but we see I mean obviously Facebook is one that people talk about in terms of social media growth and spread of social media or I'm sorry spread of misinformation on that and so that's something that you know we're we're all aware of um, you know, as well as algorithms and how those work in terms of targeting our demographics. And so other people who fit your demographic profiles, they've clicked on the, you know, these into these groups or this information. And so it's now showing up in your Facebook feed and, you know, to certain degrees, other Facebook platforms or sorry, other social media platforms do that as well, you know, Twitter and some others with the suggestions that they make, um, you know, and so it's just, from what I've seen, you know, and I think we all know this anecdotally, at least, the social media is so much of an echo chamber, and it just reinforces what we already believe. And so we've got, you know, social media allows us to find our in groups, you know, my research, I look, you know, with social identity theory, and so who are our groups, and social media allows us to go straight to those groups and to talk amongst those groups. And so all that we're hearing is reinforcing what we already believe. Um, and it just makes those voices so much stronger and it reinforces our belief. Um, and it's almost this vicious cycle and this question of, you know, how do, how do we get out of this? And part of it is understanding, you know, at least from what we see here with research in the U.S. is understanding that sometimes we're not the best person to, tie to, to try to talk to someone and dissuade them of whatever misinformation belief that they hold. Um, you know, understanding that, especially if you're seen as someone who's part of the out group, you know, if they, you're not somebody that they identify with, it doesn't matter what you say, like the truth doesn't matter. Um, and it's more about finding someone who they see as credible and believable and giving them the tools to be able to go and talk to that person or that group. Um, and on social media, that's so hard. Um, I don't see that as being an effective place to try to do things like that. Um, that's where in-person communication um, is, I think, really where you're going to be able to change minds and get you know, the, the actual truth, you know, the capital T truth shared um, over misinformation. Can I add a thing, Emmy, please? Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, we're thinking, uh, I was thinking about uh, when we were talking about education and the need for news literacy. Uh, Sylvia and I uh, have um, argued for a time now that we think that this news 
and news literacy should include technology literacy because we are not going to get rid of these platforms or these algorithms or this artificial intelligence. So we as journalists and um, um, teachers of journalists and um, professors of journalists, we should teach our students how to deal with how to understand these, these new mediations that are not going to go away. So I, I think um, how to do to deal with that that's uh we have to we have a lot of points to 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 tackle but uh one thing that we can do as professionals and uh, as as teachers is to teach our students to deal with this and to understand these new mediations to not ignore them because they are there and they are interfering in our public in our circulation of information and misinformation Right. Well, and it's so important too to teach it beyond journalism students. Like yeah. we're preaching to the choir, you know, so to speak, with with that. And these are people who want to receive the message. You know, this is why it's so important to have this in, you know, throughout the lifetime, you know, your, your lifespan in elementary school, um, yeah. all the way up to college. You know, it's I some universities here in the US actually have media literacy types of classes that are open to all majors. And that's something that I think all of us would love to see at the college level where we have some bit of control of making things like that happen. Um, but, you know, across the states in the US, there is no standardization for what literacy education looks like. And this is why it's so difficult because you know, we all agree that technology education must be a part of this. Yeah. But getting that to be picked up in any kind of a standardized way so that there's some consistency to it is so difficult. Yeah. Marcus, you seem to be nodding. Do you want to add oh. your thoughts? <laughs> well, no, I would agree with all that. We do have a um, entry level Common Core uh, media literacy course that works pretty well here at SAM, but it's challenging. And I would say yes, and because it is a technology problem, but it's also a social problem, you yeah. know. And I think there's a temptation with a lot of things that journalists and academics do is to focus on the toys, right? Is to concentrate on the technology and how those mechanical innovations can change our industry or change our, our democracies. And I get that. Obviously, we need to address the technology and those innovations. But at the same time, some of the toxicity that we're seeing, some of this disinformation is ancient. You know, a lot of the conspiracies swirling around about January 6th and, you know, the whole QAnon bit, that's not new. That's not digital. That's ancient. You know, that, that predates all this technology that's now being used to circulate it. So I think that's part of the challenge is, I mean, it's like we're doing improv, right? Like it's yes and. We have to do the technology and we have to understand how tech influences all this toxicity, but at the same time, we have to sort of isolate the thing and talk about the thing independently of the platform. And it's, it's tricky, it's really difficult. Well, and the thing, I mean, honestly goes back to we've got a large segment of the population that distrusts all media and it goes clear back to the Goldwater uh, wow. campaign historically. And you're looking at a situation where it's just simply ramped up and ramped up and increased to the point where now you have an entire media ecosystem that's designed to tell us that the entire rest of the media ecosystem is presenting you news you can't trust. We're the only legitimate news type of news source. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think it's a complicated situation, right? As as you had brought up Amber in your slide, the, the relationship that is there is quite complicated, and there's there's no um, you know complete solution to this that's going to be solved in one one day, right? But I I do think, as you said, there has to be, I think, a connection not only between you know the understanding of the importance of of an you know, inform society, the importance of journalism, the, the technology and understanding the back end. But I think the other crucial part and kind of goes back to what you were talking about, Burton and Marcus is the local identity, the engagement with the community, the, the recognizing of being able to be with the community and of the community versus talking to the community. I think, you know, a, a big part of that can be, is it, part of this as well in terms of how we see this, um, in moving forward and if there are ways to kind of get at that, which can be quite complicated <laughs> as we've talked about. 
Uh, we've got just a few more questions before we uh, wrap up here for, for the day. Um, we've got a question from, um, from Marlos Mendez uh, about, you know, do we, do you think um, local audiences, um, and we've talked a little bit about this, so migrating to social media, he mentions in, in Rio de Janeiro, many people in newsrooms take information from social media, may, local sites will not survive this kind of competition. Um, I guess, you know, kind of putting this in the in the path for, for Burton and Marcus, you know, do you see, you know, the role of these kind of zombie sites potentially, you know, evolving into other areas around the world, um, you know, beyond just um, looking at the community journalism that's been happening here in the United States? Well, I'd certainly be worried about the trend of all politics becoming national, which I certainly think we've seen in the United States. I'd certainly be worried about exporting that elsewhere. And I don't know much about Brazil specifically, but I do know that the, you know, the national political environment down there is almost as toxic, if not as toxic as it is up here. And I would assume that, you know, there's certainly a possibility that a decline in, in local media or a decline in interest in local journalism is contributing to that because that urge to be polarized about something happening in the national capital a couple hours away, that's strong for people in the social media era. And if it's, if you don't have to worry about being that polarized about local content because there's no local content to be polarized about, or there's less local content, um, then that buffer is, is gone or, diminish severely. Well, and I worry about the, the loss of local anywhere when it comes to things like vaccine distribution. I mean, in, in places where the media is trustworthy, where the local editor is known, the local editor can do things like write an article combating some of these virus pieces of misinformation. But if that comes from a national publication or that comes from the national nightly news or even a big regional that's you know, an hour away, people are less likely to trust it. People are less likely to buy it without that connection, without that level of, of trust, without that level of experience. So that worries me no matter where it occurs. And, you know, I'm not going to say I know enough about the South American media ecosystem to, to know how their local news coverage functions, but wherever there's that loss of local news and that local connection, it worries me in their ability to counter misinformation at the local level. I think we're gonna be closing out here um, for our panel, but I wanted to ask each of you if you could um, provide everyone who's watching right now uh, with, with one key takeaway that you think folks should, should think more about, you know, whether they're in the newsroom right now, whether they're a student who's, you know, entering the journalism field or whether it's a journalism educator, <laughs> uh, a key takeaway that you think is important for them to share. Uh, we'll go over to Amber first. Oh, great. Start with me. Thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess I can tell you, so this is what I presented on today. It's part of a larger research stream I have about fake news and how do people get information? Like, you know, how do they get in information? How do they identify misinformation? I've even got part of it with some health, sco health comm scholars about COVID and social media. And one of the things that I keep coming back to that I guess keeps surprising me is the way that people will embrace <laughs> um, confirmation bias. And that for me, that's something I struggle with so much as a journalist and now as a journalism educator and as I mentioned earlier, the thing I have to keep remind myself is that sometimes it's it's not my voice that's going to make a difference, and that's really a hard thing to let go of, and to realize that I I can't win over everybody, and so instead let me find someone else who this other group, this other person is going to see as credible, and see if I can get that person to talk to this group. Um, you know, the idea of this in-group identity and if you're not seen as credible and part of that group, it doesn't matter how, what you say or how much truth you provide, how many facts you provide, they're not gonna hear you because that's not the truth as they see it. And so finding someone else to be that bridge is a really important way forward, I think, in terms of being able to overcome misinformation. 
Let's jump over to Sylvia and Amanda. You can go first, Amanda. Okay, so we continue the, the faces here in the, the screen. Uh, <laughs> I think um, I'll, I'll take my, my personal research interest that is thinking about these technologies and their interference in the communication and circulation of information. Um, I would suggest that the students and journalists pay attention to technologies and how they are not neutral. They are not neutral. They are not neutral. <laughs> Try to look at that and to see critically uh, algorithms, platforms, and all the affordances and interfaces that you are dealing with. Um, the, the, the most you can in your daily routine, but try to, to keep critical uh, looking at this technologies. Uh, and I would like to call the attention of the students for the relationship of artificial intelligence and data, and big data, for example. So I would pay attention for data journalism, and I think learning tools uh, to not just to write great stories, news stories, but also learn how to, uh, to produce charts and to deal with data journalism and investigative journalism is something that is really close to automated journalism. Marcus, you can oh, go okay. next. <laughs> I would say, don't be afraid to double down either as a student or a journalist on local news and on local coverage and finding ways to incorporate and adapt major national ideas and national problems within a local lens. Um, and for that matter, I would recommend getting involved in that local community in other ways too. Uh, you know, I feel like politics are such a big part of our lives because we don't have the same number of outside interests that we used to. And I wonder if investing in local reporting and local journalism, but also just local civic participation wouldn't make a tremendous difference in reducing the toxicity in our political environment right now. And Burton, you have the last key takeaway. <laughs> oh my. So I guess for me, if I was talking to someone running a major newsroom, particularly a Gannett or a Digital First, my comment would be, don't give up on the local publications. Don't regionalize everything. Don't cut off your nose for that short-term profit increase because the reality is in the long term, it's going to have a negative impact. And you know, the industry, journalism is supposed to be about more than just making money. Excellent points. Ah, well, we've run out of time. I would love for us to talk more. <laughs> we could talk for this for hours. But uh, thank you all for sharing your research and your amazing insights with everyone this afternoon. And for those watching, please take a look at isoj.org slash research to look at this research that these amazing folks have, have done um, and definitely follow them in their future research that they're gonna be doing. So thank you all again for joining us. And I'm gonna hand it off to Rosenthal who's gonna have some announcements before the end of the day. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you uh, all of you, muito obrigado. Uh, this was really great. I, I think I learned a lot in this session and I had, uh, you know, some of the topics that that have been concerning us with the algorithms, with the, I learned the zombies that I, I never heard before uh, in that <laughs> context, but, but, but I think, I think it was a very informative session. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. So now I want to thank also all the other uh, panelists and, and uh, chairs that uh, spoke today. The second day was, was really very strong, as I said in the, in the beginning. And, uh, you know, to those of, of you who uh, from all over the, the world have been following us on your laptops, on your cell phones, uh, I thank you so much for participating in this uh, second day. Keep going uh, with the, the conversation on, on Twitter. Uh, and um, also, don't forget that if you missed any of the sessions, you can still uh, find the sessions 
the videos on on, uh, on the channel uh, of ISOJ Night Center, ISOJ at um, YouTube. Um, we want to thank Google News Initiative and Knight Foundation, the major sponsors. Uh, muchas gracias a Univision por, por apoyarnos con la traducción al español. So don't forget any um, uh, ISOGERS that, uh, that you, you, if you want to keep the conversation going, you can go now to wonder to uh, this software that you can become a little bubble and, and go around. Uh, so we have a wonder room for more conversations and the, the chance to network and collaborate with, uh, with your peers. Just, just follow the link that in the chat to, to be placed in, in the wonder room. So see you again uh, tomorrow with another um, fantastic day of ISOJ 2021. Thank you very much.